Ladies and gentlemen, my mind some other people, so you're very welcome to that one. Stepping up to the panel at the very last moment. I mean, you literally saw them being persuaded. Uh, and Delante are yeah. going to talk behind the sofa about <laughs> anniversary of Patrick Ferguson, including, I believe, Dr. Who. Oh, I think that might be one. Well, if I'd known, I'd bought a cushion to hide behind. Oh. <laughs> well, I shall hand over to the person in charge. Well, I've got... Oh, no, wait. Round of applause for our panel, please. <laughs> That's always going to cheer me up. And on that note, can I please say it's my first Armada Con. I think it is brilliant. I like it so much. I have signed up. I am loving hearing this. Also, could I please say a great big thank you to everybody who said, are you okay? Because right now I am very, very anemic. And that means, therefore, if you want to run away from me, now's your opportunity, because I can't keep up with you all. <laughs> okay, this is meant to be a guest panel, so can I pretend to be a guest? I've been on TV. So yeah, actually, why don't I just introduce myself very quickly? So yeah, what the heck am I doing sitting on this panel? Well, I've been to conventions for years. Actually, I have to say, in terms of anniversaries, one of them is Babylon 5. Babylon 5 is what got me first going to conventions. I got really, really angry when I got turned down by KPMG. Don't need them. Uh, <laughs> so, um, because I was trying to leave a job I really didn't like. As a result, my knee jerk reaction was, well, I'm going to do something fun. I signed up to a Babylon 5 convention. It was, it was Star Fury 98. And since then, I found, I essentially found my people. And when it comes to these anniversaries, I do feel a lot of it is about finding your people, finding something that genuinely captures your imagination. Because one of the most awesome things about these anniversaries of shows, and indeed Discworld, I'm just going to say Discworld in its own separate um, entity, because there's just so much appreciation, good feeling, and there's just so much about it. And it's genuinely inspiring. Um, so, saying a bit more, I'm, I'm a former ZZ9 um, um, president as well, so I do believe there was a little nod to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as well. Um, but really, um, saying about this, the fact you've got these fan clubs, you've got events, you've got the conventions, you have the people to discuss, and it's such a brilliant way as well to bring together ideas, and there have been such a universe of ideas in these shows. And that's essentially why we're here. Thank you so much for my emergency holographic um, pan fellow panellists, because otherwise I'd be sitting here yapping, and you'd probably be, you might be bored, but most of all you might be a bit weirded out, and going straight to the bar and take them go, I'm not going to say that to the hotel. I won't say that to the hotel. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I've yapped on, and I've introduced myself. Could I please? of Armadacon since Armadacon 1, wow. where I was chief steward. Uh, a few things have changed since then. I've been on, on and off the committee, and I've done, I've been chairman, treasurer, secretary, programming. <laughs> I've been around a bit. I had a big gap while I was doing the mum thing, and then came back. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm now currently treasurer again. Um, and only now it's all electronic. It wasn't when I last did it. <laughs> it's like magic. I used to have to run down to the bank with the cheques to pay them in and pray they cleared before the hotel charged us. It's a whole other world. Um, you point out that your son did grow up, you didn't know. This is true. He was here on Friday. People might not recognise him because he's like that tall instead of Hagrid. that tall. <laughs> Sorry, was that a troll <laughs> cosplay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was the, it, it was the tidy that was looking. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's my son. No, son. Um, Fandom-wise, uh, I, I, my first love was Doctor Who. Um, I, I, my sisters watched it before I did and were terribly upset when it got turned off because it might scare the little one. 
So when I absolutely fell for it, they were a bit miffed that I hadn't fallen for it sooner. Uh, I came in around about sea levels and, and then caught up on the backlog as soon as technology and, well, I've had all the target novelizations, but whenever it was available, I caught up on the backlog as well. And continue to this day, nothing has put me off as yet. Um, I've, I've branched out into many, many, many of the other fandoms. Uh, I, I have to nod to my sister Maureen, who got me into most of them. Um, particularly fantasy, where she got me in, into fantasy by, by saying that David, David Edding's books were a little bit like Blake Seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got a similar sneaky theme. Oh, okay then. Oh, hello, fantasy. <laughs> Dragons, never looked back. Um, Dragons are cool. Yeah. <coughs> Okay. Um, how can I put it? I'm Dave. Everybody knows who I am. Um, I chaired the first con, which was also the first proper con I ever actually went to. I have to say, a learning curve that shape is not a smart idea. I learned that that first con. Um, more, more critically, I proposed to Alison the day before the first con. We weren't even going out with each other. Anymore. That's also awesome, true. Um, I went round with, with Bad said the chairman, and her Bad said the chairman's brain, and very true. Um, and yes, we've been, I've, I've done every job under the sun for the con, whether they like it or not. You haven't done treasure. I haven't done treasure. No, I haven't done treasure. Do not make me do treasure. <laughs> we wouldn't. Don't yeah, unless you want me to spend money. I am very good at spending money. Ask the person. So it'll be the lightsaber yesterday. Right, moving on. Um, yes, my experience. If it's sci-fi, I've probably watched it. If it's a um, sci-fi book, I've probably looked at the cover at least once. <laughs> I, like I like pictures. I like pictures. This is not a lie. The SFX magazine comes in every month, and I say, are we really reading this? And he says, no, I'm only getting it for the pictures. <laughs> nice pictures. <laughs> um, my, my memories of sci-fi go back to, yes, my first Doctor Who I can remember watching would have been the first Pokey story, but it's not the first Doctor Who that I heard. Um, as the, the title of this panel is behind the sofa, I will generally say I have very clear memories of listening to Patrick Trevor stories from behind the sofa. Couldn't leave the room, had to be in the room, had to listen, just couldn't watch them. Which is strange, because nowadays if I'm watching sort of horror movie type things which I'm not a big fan of, I can watch the goriest thing on, on the telly with my fingers in my ears. I don't like <laughs> noises, but I'm quite happy with <laughs> There you go. Uh, yes, I've been on television too many times. Uh, um, I once kissed Alison and her sister in Germany, so on the German TV news. So, obviously I'm a good kisser. Uh, and, and I did once, oh, once oh, ten years ago, I trended on Twitter for turning up to a convention dressed as Tegan. <laughs> and that, that was the nearest one. That but, sounds nice. but yes, if it's sci-fi, I've liked it, and yes, I've genuinely I've hidden the hide. So, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to flip over. It's going to be a pan when you ask questions. I'm going to ask you guys, hands off. Has anybody ever actually sat behind the sofa, or is it just me? Uh, uh, oh, thank God for that. I genuinely have. Yeah. My mother declared that, that she knew what a scary bit on any program was coming up because I would get off the chair and go and sit behind it. So, so About five seconds before the scary bit. Any particular one? That, that, that. Yeah. To my embarrassment, the only one I remember literally hiding behind the sofa for was Joe Ninety. <laughs> <laughs> but I must have been very small. There, there, was, there was a drill menacing somebody, oh. and that was yeah. too much for me, and, and I went and hid behind the sofa. Well, especially if it's a rat. Yeah. yeah. I'm ashamed to admit that I hid behind the sofa when I was watching Robin Hood once because there was a man in black who was chasing me with an axe through the dungeons. And you know, that's just stayed with me for the rest of my life. I know he's behind you now, I can see. <laughs> 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 Oh, I have managed to watch that Joe 90 scene since. I kind of dared myself. And, and I remember thinking. Yes, I can totally cope with this now, but my God, they show this to little kids. <laughs> it's, it's like Captain Scarlet. What the heck were you thinking? 
<laughs> this is about zombies. What are you doing? <laughs> I was so disappointed when I went to school and read my school briefcase and it didn't look like Joe Knight. I'm gutted. What are you doing, Tom? What are you thinking about a movie that... I, but the first time I watched it, I just couldn't deal with it. The visibly... Anybody who has ever seen Event Horizon, mm -hmm. yeah. do not watch it when you have ulti ulterior uveitis and you're taking eye drops. Because I got to a certain point in that flipping movie and I just went, I don't want to watch it anymore. And it was like, no. And I didn't watch it for years. And then me and my lovely partner, we sat down and watched it because I, I was really impressed with Jason Isaacs in um, Star Trek Discovery because actually he plays such a he plays such a of a captain. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it PQ13 here. Um, I will probably fail, but don't worry. But actually, when I watched it again, I really liked it. Especially the Prodigy song, Funky. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was actually quite an achievement, because having been that disturbed, this time around I did not have problems. No, I didn't. No, I can't even have had problems with my eyes. It does not like that, but anyway, it was a sheer achievement of actually being able to watch that and, and not be terrified. And I do know there have been, there have been certain, <laughs> there have been certain Doctor Who adventures where I've watched it and gone, oh really, but, but the ironic thing is when I hid behind the sofa, I was actually hiding from my dad. I can't remember why I was hiding from my dad, but it wasn't even anything to do with Doctor Who, so that's disappointing. <laughs> um, it, it's an interesting one because having had a son in exactly the right age group, so when the new series came along, he was seven, and I knew that was the age at which I was when I'd fallen in love with Doctor Who. And I desperately wanted him to fall in love with Doctor Who. And I, I did the thing you're not supposed to do. I got hold of a bootleg copy before transmission. Now, I'm going to say that I, I feel morally justified insofar as this meant I could watch it myself in advance to check whether he would be okay with it. And so I was aware the, the bit where... Um, Mickey gets eaten by the yeah, yeah. Yes. The, the <laughs> bit. I felt that that actual, the prelude to the birth was a little bit much. So I had a slice of chocolate cake on standby to distract him with for just that couple of seconds. It was one chocolate slice. You had one as well. Oh. I to record. <laughs> um, and so I knew once we hit the book and he giggled, we were fine. It's, it's interesting because on the one hand, yes, I broke the rules, but I have no qualms about that because I feel like I broke them in an entirely appropriate cause. These days it would be much easier because you, you'd watch it at release time and then you'd let them watch it the next day on iPlayer. That, that would be much easier. But back then, that, that was not currently as yet an option. Um, but also, point two, I as a grown-up fan hated the burp. I thought that was so blooming stupid. But I, as a mother, loved that burp because it was the perfect counter for the scariness that had immediately gone before. And it was strange to have both those feelings of us. <laughs> it, it is interesting, not just what reactions people have. So, for example, another scary episode, it was a scary episode, Blink. <laughs> now, what I found ironic about Blink was parents were up in arms. Oh my gosh, it's too scary for the children. Oh, oh no, 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 no. What it boiled down to was, the majority of it was, the parents were terrified, the kids were blooming loving it. Yeah. And they were like, yeah. So we had people walking past, walking past statues going, and the kids were like, yeah, I want to see a weeping angel. <laughs> but uh, funnily enough, again, the, the experience with Jamie was that he loved the episode. The episode was absolutely perfect. It was the insertion of real life images at the end that freaked him out. While he was immersed in the television universe and he could say to himself, oh, that's not so made up, it's actors, blah, 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 fine. Disassociate, enjoy. Show the real pictures at the end, suddenly it's, oh, oh no, I don't want that anymore. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> I can't get that. 
There's slightly, when I watched, um, I think it was Family of Blood, where there's the veterans at the end. I thought the whole thing was great, but that at the end, I have never cried so much. It was done so touchingly and so well. And I think this is the strength of things like Doctor Who. You've got that where they reference real life, but also it's the quality of writing. I know it's been very up and down, but with that, it nailed it so perfectly, and it was respectful. I think this is the other thing. It's where things are respectful. They're not taking, you know what, it's essentially yes to acknowledge, and actually, yeah, more power to you. And that, I feel, is what genuinely endures where you've got that relatable aspect, <coughs> where you've got that thing that really, it genuinely, it comes on your heart in such a way that it celebrates and honours. But the thing yeah. when, when you watch a television show or, or a film or you read a book and it's scary, there's that barrier. Mm. You can put it down, you can turn it off, you can walk away, it's great. The scary thing is when you've got broccoli on them and your fork. So I bloody well can't stand. So, Ulyssa, yeah. You moan, I want to suck your nose, all right? <laughs> oh, so brave. I've eaten broccoli. I want a medal. <laughs> oh, God, it's horrible. Oh, there's a problem with chocolate great. dip for your broccoli. <laughs> oh, yeah. I actually find broccoli's great with salad cream. Mm. There again, that's as big as I am strange. But Alice has sort of touched on one. Oh, yes, by comparison to salad cream. <laughs> I do apologise, but... But Alison jumped on the one open, seeing something that scared her as younger, and you go back and try to... Was that it? And I don't know, because people said, oh, we're baking behind the sofa. Have, have you gone back to it and said, well, what, what, what was I scared of? I mean, the only film I, over 18 I ever watched, underage, jumped in the deep end, The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And I made it Not most really of the way I through and thought, it, yeah. no, I'm a bit young and I left. Mm -hmm. And then many years later I watched and I discovered I left five minutes before the end. <laughs> <laughs> the scariest bit of the exorcist is the five minutes of cerebral angiography that's shown <laughs> right at the beginning. The rest of it is hysterical. <laughs> I, I, can't, I counter that by saying, so, so me, me, my lovely person, a very, a very um, good friend of ours, Ed, we, we went to see The Exorcist, and for me, this was The Exorcist Challenge. And I said, right, you can take bets on how long I will last. So, ever since various hospitals, days and stuff like that, I'm very, very easily squicked to the point where there will be little noises, and I just can't. I, I just, anything gross out, gross out comedies, anything like that, it's just massively known, and there are certain things I just can't stand it. Mm -hmm. But with that, there, there is the bit which I found really hard to deal with. But the thing I found interesting was, actually it was, it was very well written. But yeah, that scene, that scene, that scene with the brain scan, having had loads of brain scans and stuff done that, uh, stuff done like that to me, because of a stroke and everything, I sat there and I felt great relief because um, medical technology has progressed and had they have tried that on me, I, I just, I would have been like, no. Nah. Oh, yeah. Nah. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was like, <sighs> but I, I did like the way that one of the priests was quite, he, he was obviously, he was like a gigolo priest. <laughs> and there were just so many bits and pieces there. Mm -hmm. It was, it was fascinating. But get with that one, that's good that he had on his own screen. And it's the way that it's genuinely attracted so much discussion, debate, and and um, I go and see Mark Hamill live in 3D. Mm. He says how it is his favourite movie, and it's hearing that introduction from him and hearing about just the impacts it's had, and then the conversations that that sparked after that. It's a genuinely fascinating take on it. So you've got this movie, and it could just stand on its own, but, but no, you've got all this interest, you've got all this, it's like a community building up around it, although they can keep the peace soup, I won't have any. Noting that you're a fellow Commodian, you'll love to know that while you were talking earlier on about Jason, Jason Isaacs, we immediately muttered hello, hello to Jason Isaacs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has to be done. It has to be done. <laughs> and Fairport Convention while we're at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did actually say hello to Jason Isaacs because I sang, I sang on national TV 
live on national TV. I sang in Klingon, and a few months later I was able to say, hello, Jason Isaacs. So when I sang in Klingon on the one show, and you were a guest there, how is it for you, darling? Is that, oh, that was you, you were brilliant, so I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to jump in. Oh, no, definitely. Because I am, I'm ashamed. <laughs> If you, I'm sorry. If you may. <laughs> Why do we feel the need to, you know, we can't see this, but we can hide behind the sofa and safe. We could leave the room. Oh no, because then you don't know how it finishes. Mm. You don't know if, if, you, if you've invested mm -hmm. enough emotion in it to feel the jeopardy of the character that is making you hide behind the sofa, I, th I feel like you absolutely have Especially with something like Doctor Who, where the odds are, let's face it, pretty good, there's going to be a happy ending. <laughs> you kind of have to stick with it in order to finish that off, otherwise it, that unanswered question will haunt you for the rest of your life. So yeah, you take whatever precautions you, you can to get past that particular sticky bit, and then you're on board for the rest of the story. Or is it the, you know, no matter how icky it is, or scary, or screaming, or loud, or squelchy, You've seen you've seen with this, and it's probably not as bad as if you didn't think it, see it. Oh, you'll make your worse imagination endings. comes up with worse. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> the, the, the endings I'd have come up with. What I worried was going to happen in Joe 90 was something they definitely wouldn't have shown on Joe 90. I didn't realise that at the time. <laughs> well, somebody <laughs> meant to buy a drill, they were going to be in lots, lots of little scratchy pieces all over the place. I'll change the music. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 we'll do. This is a single video, horror film or Picture the one. It's all blood and gore, whatever you see. I like it whenever they sort of get up to the point and they, they cut away. The best ending of a film, I think, of a lot of films, is the very final scene of the fog, where, yeah. where the, the, the priest is in the church thinking, Why did it come for me? And he turns around and all the ghosts are, and the guy just slices the sword and it gets to like an inch of his neck and it cuts the black lock in the credits. So you don't see it, you don't need to, but it's well, at the end of Blake 7, all you lose mm. the gunshot. <laughs> and you don't know whether any of them are set to stuff. Would you like to hit behind yeah. the sofa for Blake 7? I'm reasonably certain that Avon's was. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only one you're not sure about. I wish I hit behind the sofa when the ship got attacked and Villa did a perfect backwards somersault. Mm. I half expect him to stand off and go, ta da! <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could that. Mm. I'm you haven't mentioned Stone Oh. Stone Um. Does anybody, if I said stone tapes, no, yeah. Yeah. I don't most people know. I don't. But if I said you know Quatermass, yeah, I the writer of that book wrote a ghost story for goodness called the stone tapes. The, stone tapes. Stone tapes. Stone tapes. Stone tapes. the premise stone tapes. Tapes. of this one is um, they are researching new technologies to record information. They go to an old building, they're working and move in, and they're told that it's haunted. And they see they come across apparition, and they start investigating this. And they come up with the concept that the very fabric of the building, the stone, is, a, is recording history. Hence, it's a stone tape. <coughs> and they're investigating, and as they go back and further and further, it becomes apparent that, yes, they've seen a girl die as a ghost, and that was repeated. But it's what terrified her is the early apparitions. And it's, and though it's just flashy, like in 1970s, flashy lights. But it was the noise again, I mean, noise. And that one, I could probably watch, I own it on DVD. I could watch it with the bloody sound off. It, it just, there's something about the sound in that film. Yeah. Just, mm, I can do it. There, there are certain vibes, certain vibes I get. What I found interesting was, so me, I'm sorry, darling, I'm gonna keep referring to you. Um, my, my, dear, my dear, lovely partner, Tyrone, a.k.a. Kitty, <coughs> who puts up with this and, and, and deserves a medal, like, like loads of medals. So we watched a movie called, now was it Chamber of Horrors, where they had the horror horn and the fear flash. And what we noticed was the way that just before something was meant to be scary, there'd be this, there'd be this sort of flashing light, and then uh, or something like that, but it wasn't actually that scary. And they had they had this thing where people were meant to look away. And I really think what they were capitalising on was 
it's scarier in your mind. It's like yeah. another another like very desperate gentle version is my mum preferred the book of the sheep pig to the movie because the pictures are better in the book because you get to imagine <laughs> and you get to think these things through. And actually the book is just enchanting. But there is that aspect of it's when you don't see things or where for example something's hinted at. And the brain can be absolutely horrible for working out what's the worst thing that could happen. And what's, what's very sad, you have your... There is talking of the sound. In 1958, and I know most of you are far too young to remember, there was a program on TV called The Red Grass. And I've no idea why my parents let me watch it, but this seeds came from space, and if you touched the red grass, you went mad, and that sort of thing. And the one thing that sticks in my mind is they got this grass and they put it in a container with a glass door. The scientists in his suit and tight, because in those days they were all walk to that room and the door comes open and the glass goes mm. And do you know something? That terrified me. And it only uh, there's only Vicky and one other person I never remembered it, and that's Nigel Payne. And he said it's the most scary thing mm. he ever saw. It was, again, you sang the sound. That was all it was. It was going to... Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to... Just, um, I was off school sick at one time, and this was, this was the 1970s, so naturally I was watching Open University. Mm -hmm. That's sick children on. did. Yeah. <laughs> that was the only channel I was doing. <laughs> Or horse racing. Mm. So, um, as luck would have it, the program that came on, actually no, it must have been 80s, given what, what, what I saw. Mm. The program that was on was talking about incidental music. And this, this was something I wanted to discuss with Dominic, but <coughs> who certainly couldn't make it today. Um, because they showed a clip from Doctor Who. Uh, it was from the Peter Davison Dalek one. And it was him and Antigone in the Docklands area, walking outdoors. They showed it the first time as it was, with, with all the incidental music. And it's very, very scary, it's very, very tense, and there's a noise in there, ah, and it's a cat. <laughs> a cat knocks over a dustbin, or jumps out of a dustbin, or the cat dustbin incident occurs. <sighs> Then they showed it without the incidental music. Dear God, was it flat. It was just, la 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 la, oh look there's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. some, some do something similar on the YouTube. They took the same huge. clip yeah. and they changed and the music. And yet subtle. And it just changed the yeah. entire tone of the scene. Yeah. yeah, when I was at university, um, I studied television production. And the first lecture that I had for audio theory was exactly the same thing. The two things we were shown were the opening sequence of the fog, which is just the ticking, and then somebody closing a pocket watch, uh, and a sequence from John Carpenter's Halloween. And that was to show the difference between adding sound effects and how flat it is without, and the use of music, just Carpenter's music. It's sort of iconic for that film. And as Ali said, without either of them, there's nothing effective at all. And it's wonderful how, when incidental music is done, right, it evokes all of that emotions and you do not know it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you're going, oh, that's Rose's theme, isn't that sweet? They, they didn't do it right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would add that sometimes yeah, modern movies, there's just too much music. Because if you watch the original Dan Master, that mm -hmm. final thing of them actually coming and attacking the dance, there's no music, nothing. And I was really surprised when we watched that because I've just used more of the movies that it's all crawl, plastered all over it. Mm -hmm. thing, I find it terribly sad that the job of the incidental music music composer is not to be consciously noticed, but only subconsciously noticed. I hope they understand themselves how much they really are bringing it to it, how much we do appreciate it even if we don't know that we appreciate it. I think I keep the music. Um, one of the one of my favourites, one of my absolute favourites, is Doctor Who episode Utopia, where you've got the build-up of music, where there's the You Are Not Alone and Professor Yana opening a pocket watch. Mm -hmm. And so help me, in terms of composition, the way you've got that lead-up, 
is just, I just love it. I, I, I have watched it so many times now because it's, you can hear the music start off, but it's beautifully, it's just beautifully composed. And then it ramps up, it ramps up, and it ramps up. And then you've got the reveal. And it's just, it's a little bit nuts. It's, it's suspenseful, but it just adds. It goes together. It is such a brilliant composition. And it's when you've got music that does that. Mm -hmm. And you're right, with sound effects and with, with movies, it's where you've got that rougher calm I love. Because, again, it's the use of the music. And it's almost like a composition all on itself, on a, all its own. But it's just, it just grabs you. But I think, in light of what Barry said, I am so tempted for the next convention, so I'm warning you now, I really want to re-record the music to Alien. And currently in my head, I have the Benny Hill theme. It's been what could done. Um, it's been done? Yeah, Star Wars, Jar Jar Binks. Oh, nothing can improve that. Yeah, <laughs> they put the Benny Hill music on it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, like it's, it. yeah, it's on YouTube. But, <laughs> I need to with, with YouTube it. again, if you look at the end sequence of the good, bad and the ugly, it's eight minutes long. And it's just three people looking at each other and a musical sequence. That's all it is. And it's one of the best regarded scenes in the Western. And, and yes, even, even with ones that you do notice, that there can be a magic to it. For example, um, I suspect everybody here is probably too old for it, but for, the, for the, those with kids, anyone who watched Dexter's Laboratory, which I highly recommend, incidentally, for all ages, um, there is a, it's a cartoon, kids' cartoon, but it has clearly been written by the likes of us. Because there is a, uh, it, there's an episode Dexter and his mates trying to go to a comic con and ended up in the Barbie convention. Yes. <laughs> and they're convinced that all these girls have been trapped in stasis and they need to remove them. And they open, so they that open them the box. So there's trying to rescue the Barbies and the dealer's going, no. mint condition, never, never remove from, from, from box. box. <laughs> it's a zombie horde of Barbie collectors. But the bit that really got me was in, in the middle of all this, when, when a tussle breaks out, they play the battle music from... Gamesters of Triskelion. <laughs> you know what I mean. Even da, 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 da. But even worse, that the floor of the convention has exactly has the, the same pattern on, on it. Oh my god. If you've never watched Dex Dexter's right. Laboratory, you have missed something. If, if you watch no other Dexter's <laughs> Laboratory, please try and seek out that one episode. <laughs> you will not be disappointed. It sounds amazing. I will actually, I've actually yeah. made a note yeah. of but this. <laughs> And, and this is one of those lovely things, again, we were, um, I think we were discussing in the bar the other night, that the makers now are the people that grew up as we did through, through this wonderful bath of, of sci early sci-fi. And it's great to see that, that they have a, a, a love for some of the same things that we got a love for, and now it's coming out the other side. <laughs> Beautiful. It, it is truly wonderful. It really is. It must be there's some, I can only assume there's some connection between your ears and your heart that's a lot closer than your eyeballs and your, you could, I could play a classical music and, and the whole room would say, oh that's beautiful. I could put a classic painting on and the music, oh, that's a piece of shite. I, I, th I, th I think visuals are very, sub very subjective, but I think for some reason sound connects with us a lot easier, I don't know why. I think it's more universal. That, that really makes me think of when, when we did the Queen's. And I was finding, this, this is what I find interesting, I was finding I was really connecting and I wasn't alone in, so, so Blake Seven, chill, and then being, battle, various Battle on Five themes, I will absolutely chill out while I just feel really elated and happy. And I'm sure I'm not alone, I'm sure that many of you have go-to theme music that just makes you feel so much better about stuff. Yes, I got two questions, well, two queries. I actually sing in the choir. Oh, awesome. As an alto. So I'm I obviously an alto know, as well. As, uh, so I obviously know exactly where you're coming from with, about the influence of music on your emotions, which is basically what we're talking about. Uh, we do a mix 
I won't say which choir it is because it's not actually clear. Ah, but we do, yeah, big blue chorus. Um, but we do like a mix of, uh, well, this time of year, the Christmas, uh, and normal stuff. But we also do some new film music bits and pieces as well. And the difference between the different types of music that you're learning and the emotions that they put out once you're singing with other people, it's quite amazing. I would actually, following on from that, I agree with you completely, fellow alto. Um, I, I did music to A level, um, so, so a bit of composition as well. And I've got such a fondness for a diminished chord, or as I call it at home, scrunchy. Because there's nothing quite like hearing one of those resolve. Mm -hmm. And it's something you can only get with harmony. It's something yeah. you can only get with a choir, with an orchestra. You cannot achieve it with a soloist. No, we, get, we usually have at least, some of the harder stuff we do has got at least four or five harmonies running through it. Mm -hmm. So you've not only got the basses and the tenors, you've also got two different sets of uh, um, altos and you've also got two different sets of sopranos. And they're all singing different bits. Mm -hmm. And that's accompanied by music sometimes as well. You can imagine how that sounds like when you've got all that going on. All, and you all have to learn slightly different versions. You've got to try and not keep on the same piece that somebody else is singing, even in your own section. Because it's very awkward to do. Mm -hmm. But it all comes together. It's all lovely when it's all done. It, it's amazing how it just if you get it if you get it just right mm. you can you can genuinely feel the warmth mm. or the oh no, and just so much mm. yes you, you feel lots and of the feel classic warmth. example that we've been doing is rise up is one example you you got emotion in that mm. that's just one there's loads of others oh that's a great thing about music really there's just so <coughs> much. It's, it's so diverse. Mm. When I was with the, with the choir, we, we, sang, um, we sang various James Bond themes, yeah, and that. some of it was a great laugh, and I'm, mm. just, I'm just loving it. And mm. they, said, they essentially said, no, it's okay, if you want, if you want to jig, mm. like you do, it's okay. We, we, we endorse this entire, like, great, because so, I'm speaking like said, so much. We're basically a community choir, so we sing all types of music. We don't do, the only time we do, church music, mm -hmm. it's Christmas time and the carols, mm -hmm. that's the only time. I, I, I'm going to come on two things, but I'm, I'm trying to attempt to learn the sound, but just making an observation as a question, yep. is it's well known that mothers singing to their child in the womb soothes the child, which makes you think that you're responsive to sound before you're even born, when you've yeah. got no visuals, possibly that's why the sound gets more. Mm -hmm. but I I will come to you, but I want to come to you. I want to come back to the people that said they hit on the silver we didn't hear from. Because I want to hear what yeah. other things people hit from. So oh gosh, yes, absolutely. So yeah. firstly, um, I have been to I've had been to a sound bar and the lady there says that it's the, the reason some sounds effects of effect is resonate resonant because it brings fluid and you Sounds can resonate with the brain, but she knows a lot more about that. But that's that's resonance, vision, and water. I, I think that also ties in with the recent trend. There's been certainly I've been quite a lot of YouTube videos about a AMSR, is it? I, I, it's not worked for me. But there's supposed to be something about somebody speaking very softly and slowly explaining what they're doing, like talking through a recipe or something like that. Oh, that makes you feel homicidal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, some people apparently get get an actual physical buzz in the head from it. I tried a few. It didn't work for me. I mostly felt like I was going to doze off to sleep. <laughs> so maybe it's relaxing, but cool. it, it didn't. I didn't have a sensation. Mm. So there were things children stands. Mm. Yeah. Oh. I didn't see it until I was an adult. Well, I haven't seen I, it. I've heard, I saw I've it all the time. And yes, blimey, that was powerful. That was very powerful. Mm. I that, there's at least two people I've heard from who hid around the sofa. We didn't find what they did from. What was there, I believe? What was it then? I don't have very early memories for some reason, but one of them is one of Dr. Boone's where the spider jumps on the back of the person. Oh, yeah. And 
any 50 other, years ago. Yeah. Any jumping always makes me screech. But I can watch a spider climb over my bed in the middle of the night, and it's like a... <laughs> Certainly, but I believe it was Matt Irving no. that did the, did the spider effect for that one. He put a lot of work into making it exactly hairy enough yeah. and, and getting the scuttling motion mm -hmm. as well as could be done with the technology of the time. And yeah, there, there were a lot of comments to as type off of the old com equivalent. <laughs> as a rat from what we say is the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to scary and behind the sofa, um, I, and when it was repeated a short while back, um, I saw a few clips from it. But sitting in my eBay folder, and I haven't bought it, or I am an R, is what has actually been called a communist, communist um, uh, folk tale, is the actual DVD to the singing ringing tree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And some of the stuff in that was That's bizarre. Bizarre. That's such a bloody weird. It, it was the 1970s. We, we, we covered in another panel how much they yeah. loved scaring kids in the 70s. Yeah. And you can sum it up by mushrooms. <laughs> but it's like my, um, it's like my yeah. sister. Um, the Cybermen scare her to this day. Because basically, from when they first went, and there was the, the thing that spun around, and it got bigger and bigger. But Space 1999, when Brian Blessed melted, and she couldn't watch anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm going back to another decade, and the thing that scared me was Outer Limits oh, in the 60s. Yeah. And particularly the, the Galaxy Being, which was the episode where a radio station <coughs> attracted an alien. I couldn't cope with that, I had to go behind the sofa. Did you watch it when it's been on Talking Pictures? No, 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 no. no. We, we, have, we have the box set. Yeah, we have the box set. 1963, I think it was brought Going back to what Kerry mentioned about the Cybermen, um, and, and this time on the visual side, I, I know one of the things that has, has got a lot of mention, but for both Daleks and Cybermen, is the lack of body language. The, the plain face of the Cyberman. So you still have the eyes to make contact with, but you have no joy in them. You have no life behind them. And the sheer lack of anything recognizably humanoid about a Dalek, including its movement, its shape, its visual, its face, lack thereof, are all things that contribute to a fear of the different. That not picking up the body language signals that normally you would get. It, it was it was Uncanny Valley before Uncanny Valley was invented. Um, I'm sure you all know the term, but just in case anyone doesn't, um, there, it's something that's come up in animation particularly, but um, also is coming up in robotics more these days, where. You could, your cartoons, it's a cartoon. It's obviously a cartoon, it's a drawing, it's kind of blocky, it's kind of jerky. A lot of the time it's a still and then it cuts to another still. It's not particularly um, human, fluid, whatever. But as technology has got better, they're getting closer and closer and closer. And yet, not close enough. Because there are so many things must have been things going on and reactions going on that it would take a stupendous amount of programming or artwork or understanding how these things interlinked to achieve a genuine reaction. And so we still know that's wrong, that's, that's not a person, that's an animation. Even these ones they do now where they're doing a, let's make Bruce Willis look 30 years younger. Yeah. You look at it, you go, yeah. <laughs> and there's still that last step that would take so much work to conquer. Only the difference is, they've got so close that it's weird. We could write it off when it was a cartoon. We, we could write it off when it was a cardboard cut out and the jaw was going up and down. And we were okay with that. But now it's so close that it's uncomfortable. It's unnerving. Uh, and there's a lot of animators who are having to downgrade what they're doing mm -hmm. because until they can get to the other side, it, people won't like it. I think, um, oh, what was the recent one that, that set me off a bit? Uh, Tintin. Mm -hmm. I, I found the recent version of Tintin was, was hitting Uncanny Valley for me. And I found they, when they uh, 
doing a little battle angel. Yeah. Mm. They yeah. originally had the eyes bigger. Mm. I've always had things with eyes as a cat thing that I follow, Cole and Marmalade, and Marmalade has slightly larger eyes than most cats. Mm. But no, as I said, when, when they first they was looking at releasing Alita, they did what a test showing, and yeah. people said, no, the eyes are wrong. The eyes, are wrong. The, the, eyes, eyes are, the eyes are too big. Yeah. I mean, I would be intrigued to know with our, our folklore folk whether whether there's some kind of thing there because if there, there's a you you will know the elves because they don't blink enough kind of mm. mentality mm. that I feel like we've been programmed that if something is close but not close enough it's evil. <laughs> it's a shape change. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fairy tale where there's some it's animal guarding door with eyes the size of saucers. Yeah. Yeah. Magic tinderbox. That's oh, the one, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But, but the flip side of the Uncanny Valley argument is that you can use it effectively, which is exactly what they did with Megan, mm. the film Megan mm. recently, where she is essentially a humanoid looking robot, for want of a better term. And it's just that very slightly off the inhuman by using sites like CGI and actresses space that makes it uncanny value, which is what makes you on edge. It's nice to see it used on purpose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean the classic example is the Polar Express. Mm. Mm. And that really is a very good example of the Polar Express. Yeah, that, that around about that era is when they went that one step too yeah. far <laughs> down to backtrack. Yeah. You're, you're the perfect person to talk in terms of can you go too far in trying to get realism? And how far would it have to get to work? <laughs> yeah, but is, is it too far in the sense of it would just cost too much? Or is it too yeah. far and there's just, if you spend another 50% on top, but you're not really going to get any better yeah. response? Probably not. The trouble really is with the eyes. Um, that's the Mr. Wake, he wrote it. <laughs> oh, it's cold outside with... with yeah, it's yeah. Red Wall. Oh, oh that's Red Wall. That's Red Wall. Yeah. 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 All alone in the night. That's Space 1999, when you got that um, big 
It's not exactly a spider, but it's like, it's like an octopus or with lots of tentacles. Oh, you're uh, going to try and trust me. Yeah. 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 It's funnily enough, oh, yeah. Space 99 oh, episode I do remember. Watching that it, it wasn't yeah. that I was scared of it, but it became a playground game the next mm. day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it was, you're, you're, you're the icky yeah, yeah. tentacles and you lots of the ones being sucked yeah. in. It, was, yeah. it became the new tag. Is that one? What? You're talking about hiding behind the sofa, aren't you? question is, have you got examples of where you should have hid behind the sofa and didn't and then regretted it afterwards? I can think of a couple. But oh, go on. Well, well the, the two most effective jump scares that I should have hid behind the sofa for and didn't, I can think of. One is in The Changeling, which I watched when I was at university. Uh, the scene where the mirror cracks. I literally spilled coffee on the ceiling with my holy drug. So did you change the George C's top? Uh, yeah, not the Angelina Jolie one. <laughs> and, and the other one, um, I think the most effective jump scare I can think of in anything is back to Nigel Neal. And it's the just before the last commercial break in Nigel Neal's scripting of The Woman in Black, the TV version from the 80s, which is now just out on Blu-ray. I've got it on DVD, but I haven't watched it I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but it's the most effective jump scare I can think of. Uh, what point in the plot would but you suggest Perry couldn't cut down? Um, just before it happens. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's either that or we have to get Barry the camera to watch Kerry's reaction at the jump cut. The bit though, that really sent shivers down my spine was uh, you go to him and you see him on a bridge and he just drops the ball over yeah. and then, then he comes straight back in and there's this thump, 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 yeah. thump, yeah. and this ball, and that's it, it was his and daughter just comes bouncing yeah. down the stairs. And it's wet. Yeah. 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 I haven't noticed that bit. Coming back to what was it? Coming back to our one about which is scarier, sound or visual. Yeah. 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 Big Finish have just done a new version of Space 1999 and they've done Dragon's Domain. Mm -hmm. If anyone has seen and heard both, which works more for them? Interesting. Oh, Interesting. Yeah, I haven't yeah. 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 Two the yeah. um, The Southland Steel story about the photograph monster. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. story number two. Yeah. That was yes. creepy as a very creepy thing. Because of the lack of faith. Yeah. Sapphire and Steel the uh, one with the abandoned train station. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, that freaked cool. the hell. Yeah. Particularly yeah. when Joanna Lumley had the black contact in. Yeah. 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 Well, we're with the time is running against us. Can, can I just offer a palette then? Go on then. One I would suggest is the complete opposite. If you've got any love at all for the Doctor Who episode Invasion of the Dinosaurs from the Pertwee era, mm -hmm. do oh. not re-watch it. <laughs> do not maintain that love. Do not lose that love by seeing the effects with your today head on. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem I have with Invasion of the Dinosaurs is a Moon Base 3 spacesuit was actually used here. <laughs> so I happened to watch it because of course you're watching it from different angles. Okay. Well, I'm well, discuss things that have scared us mm. and, and visuals and but sound. I would say there's a yeah. lot of book reading people here, I'm going to ask you, is there anything you've read that scared you that you wouldn't watch? Oh, mm -hmm. oh plenty of things. Well, why do you think, can I please, okay. otherwise I'll explode. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scariest thing I ever saw in Space 1999 wasn't, I guess, it, in effect scary, but it's when that politician dude was meant to oh. be put to oh, sleep, uh, yeah. Yeah. and then he wakes up yeah. on, the, on the vessel going back to work, yeah. and it's Honestly, it just stayed with me, yeah. and it made me think. Commissioner Simmons. Yeah, Commissioner Simmons. Commissioner yeah, Simmons. Yeah, Simmons. Yeah, Simmons. Yeah, Simmons. Yeah, end, but yeah, that yeah. was too much. It was horrible. Mm. 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 I think that. Actually, actually yeah, to me, it's, it's just, it's just uh, justice. It's just his book I've ever thrown away and refused to read for a month. And since then, I have not watched any television version of it. So what was it again? It. 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 Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. You've already mentioned it, but I had the book The Exorcist, and I read two pages and put it on the It terrified me so much, and I would never want to see it ever. Um, the Haunting of Hill House, uh, one of the mediums in the house, is being 
approach by a girl that makes you know, creeping up on her and getting into her brain. And she's in I watched bed, the movie away. And she believes the ghost yeah. book. is in yeah, bed. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 She's yeah. yeah. Book. It's really good. In the book. Mm. Uh, she the movie does not do it justice. With a rotting cord. Oh, 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 oh,